And just think about what he's saying. He said, I'll supply everything you need for your body if you will do what? Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We got people that spend more time running out here, jogging up and down, going and playing tennis and doing all this stuff than they do spend in the word of God. It's amazing to me when I look at the body. How much does this society of ours spend on health? Gone to the gym. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. I think that if you're inactive in your job, you need a little exercise to keep a balance. But I think we can overplay it. God said, I'll take care of your body. It's amazing to me. I watch these people work out and muscle men and keep in shape and all that. Forty years old, somewhere around there, their eyes are going to go bad. They're going to go bad. Yeah, about 30, things start dropping that shouldn't sometimes. And then. Get 70 years old, you might as well figure it. You're, you're getting wore out. God says your time upon the earth is three score and ten. I think we should keep a balance. But you say, how much we spend on the body? Ladies, how much do you spend on makeup? Ooh. Heard one person say, if the barn needs painting, paint it, you know? There's nothing wrong with that. You could be the ugly duckling of the whole batch. And yet attract the most people. He even says so. He says, don't let it be the outward adorning, but what? Inward. The hidden man that is what? Hidden man of the heart. A meek and quiet spirit is of great price the sight of God. And I think we've got the exact opposite happen. We're teaching our women to be aggressive. To be on the same level as a man. Take your position beside your man. You do. And you just work, walked into the works of the flesh and the pride of life. These are some things to think about. Clothes. I'd like to go to that thing, but I just don't have nothing to wear. Well, who are we trying to kid here? Do we have to look a certain way? But not, well, I remember one time my wife. We have like an eight-foot closet. And I mean, I actually had to move out into another room with all my clothes. And she had the goal one day to open those doors and stand there and said, Honey, I don't have a thing to wear. Because as an understanding husband, I just smiled and went on. But it's not close. God said, I'll not let you run around naked. And yet we put such a priority. But I'm wondering what would happen if our priorities shifted back in here to seeking God for the peace and the joy about the things that we do. We begin to really get concerned as to what I can and can't do between me and God. It's not what man says. My attitudes, my deeds, my will. I wonder what would change. Do you believe somebody could walk up and say, hey, you need a new suit, let me go buy it for you? But do we live that way? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. If you operate in the works of the flesh, it is impossible for you to have peace and joy. Now, let me share one other thing. You're saying, but what about their salvation? What about this? Isn't this important? Yes, it is. But there's some things in Hebrews that he says you don't discuss. Did you know that? How do I enter into the kingdom of God? Because this thing is important. If there's one thing that I want is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in my life. Is that not right? Let's turn in our Bibles to Acts 14.22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. See, tribulation and suffering is the greatest thing you'll ever experience this side. If I actually told you the four blessings that come out of suffering, you guys would run home and probably ask God to suffer. Did you know there's four absolute blessings involved in this? When we have tribulation and suffering, we boo-hoo and cry and run to the pastor, and we ought to get happy. We ought to have shouting spells when it hits, because it's bringing us into the kingdom of God. It just doesn't come natural. I know God is all-powerful. And I know that He can look down and go poof, and things can be perfect for a while. But then it slides away. It's through much tribulation that we begin to understand more and more our righteousness, our relationship with God. It's through tribulation that you really begin to establish a peace that is constant. And a joy that is constant. I would like for you to turn to 1 Peter 5.10. About the greatest thing you will be able to experience this side of heaven. That thing is called suffering. The benefits are unbelievable. We have the scriptures that we should 
Rejoice and be happy in tribulation. You know, view it that way. You know what a lot of people say? You don't have to suffer as a Christian. Well, I beg to differ with you. If you don't suffer, you'll never enter into the kingdom of God. According to the scriptures. Let's look at 1 Peter 5.10 and let's read that. It says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, strengthened, and settle you. Four benefits in suffering. How many people have you seen unsettled? One day, they've been called to be a missionary. Two weeks later, they've been called to be a pastor. Oh, no, no, no. They need to be working out here on the street. And every time you see them, they're changing. They're unsettled. I'll show you a person that hasn't suffered. This word perfect, when we suffer, what becomes perfect is our desire and God's will for us. I remember one time I had a car, 17 years old, this car was. And every time I drove it to work, I had to drive 50 miles one way to work. I was living in Harriman and I'd come to Knoxville. The tops of the car, you know, they got the thread that holds up the top. Well, that had all rotted. Now, it hadn't been torn down. It just rotted and fell down. See, well, God wants me to have a new car. That's what he wants. He's just waiting for my faith to jump out here. So I began to pray. God, give me a new car. God, give me a new car. Kept praying and nothing happened. But I knew somebody was going to walk in my office one day and say, Jerry, I want to buy you a new car. I just knew it was going to happen. One day I was backing out of the driveway. And guess what? transmission fell out. So then I didn't have any car. And do you know how my prayer began to change? From God give me a new car, I started to pray, God give me any car you want, just so it runs. It was a 72 Oldsmobile I had. Do you know what God gave me? Another 1972 Oldsmobile. But it ran. You know what happened? My desire became more perfect. It wasn't a matter of having a new car. It was a matter of having a car that ran that got me there back and forth. Then it says that suffering will establish you. That means establish you. Now, we know that understanding establishes a person. As you go through suffering, you begin to what? Understand more. You've lost a very close, dear one. Unless you've suffered that, you really don't understand, do you? You can tell me how it hurts to lose your mother or father. But if I've never lost my mother or father, I really don't understand that. So suffering does help us to understand. And then he says it'll strengthen you. Oh, I couldn't go through that. But when you go through it, guess what? Somehow we survive. And when we come out on the other side, we're much stronger, aren't we? God said it would be that way. And then it settles you. You're much more content with what you have. We need to do more suffering in the body of Christ to develop. You see, it's something about suffering. When you begin to suffer, it's the greatest thing because you've got both the Christians and the heathen watching you. Did you know that? You're living on the mountaintop and you only got the part of the Christians watching you. Because the others can't see you. And I think about David. And he was in the valley. He had all the church on one side. And he had all the heathen on the other side. The greatest thing you can do is walk in the valley. Then you got the whole world looking at you. Suffering and the benefits. Walking in the valley sometimes. But it's God, what? Perfecting us. So suffering is something that we have to go through, I believe, to establish the peace. Because peace is what? Calm. It settles you. People that have peace are set. But let me share this scripture in Hebrews, the sixth chapter. that I think it's very important for us to almost memorize. But I think that if you will use this in your own life, it just eliminates some frustrations. It says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to the perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of a faith towards God. Now, what's he saying here? What is the principle of the doctrine of Christ? That's salvation, isn't it? That we must, what? Go to Christ. It's through Christ that we become saved, right? Giving him our whole life, right? It's the blood. We understand that. Now, he says, once that is established, he says, you don't keep going back on the same thing. 
And that's what we try to do. A person tells me they're saved, fine. They may not act like it. I may know. Really, they're not. But if they say they are, I have to accept that at that point. Then I begin to work on the peace and the joy. Now, he says that you don't go back and lay the foundation of salvation again. If they tell you they're saved, all right, you're saved. You're a Christian. But then he says also of the doctrines of baptisms. Some people say that you have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Some people say you do not. Some people say that you have to be dunked water baptism. Some people say you can be sprinkled. Some say they can pour it on your head. Who's right and who's wrong? Let me ask you this. How many baptisms are there? Say, we don't even know how many baptisms we are. So we really don't even know what we're talking about most of the time. Baptism of water. Baptism of Holy Spirit. Baptism of fire. Baptism of faith. Baptism of suffering. Man, there's a lot of baptisms. And yet we find ourselves what? Discussing it. Trying to convince somebody the way we see it. God said, leave that alone. You get into quarreling and debating. Then he says, of laying on of hands. Boy, this is a biggie. Some people say, you have to touch them in a certain place for them to get healed. Other people say, well, it's the man that's praying. It's his faith that heals them. Some people say, no, it's the person receiving. It's their faith. Some people say healing ain't even for today. So who's right and who's wrong? Now, we all have our opinions, don't we? And you can quarrel and debate, but you wind up in sin discussing this. Trying to be so holy, we wind up in sin. Don't worry about it. If you don't believe, I remember one time I was down to mission. Lady come out and she said, young man, she said, I just don't let anybody lay their hands on me. I said, fine, stand right there and God can heal you if he's going to heal you. If he's not, you ain't going to get healed anyway. She looked at me. She said, well, I think I'll let you do it anyway. But I wasn't going to fuss and fight if she don't think that she wants somebody to lay hands on her. Fine. I don't have to. I don't do the healing anyway, do I? So it don't make no difference. If you don't believe in healing, fine. Never will forget. I was up at Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary. I was talking to a bunch of Muslims, 25 Muslims. And you know what I heard come out of my mouth one time? You know, I'm, I have such faith in God. Now these, most of them were lifers doing 20 years or more in state penitentiary. I said, I'm so convinced that God hears us when we pray. I challenge you people, ask anything you want. And God will do it, or my God's dead. And about nine people with me about passed out. I mean, these guys, you know, they're Muslims. They don't agree that Jesus Christ was the Son of God to begin with. They believe he was a good prophet. And then I caught myself saying, what did I say? You know, it's gone through my head, and I'm standing before these. And I thought, oh, no, they're going to come in and say, I want out of here tomorrow. And all these things, I just knew they were going to say that. And I thought, oh, Lord, what did I do? But... Everybody just froze. I mean, nobody moved. In the back of my mind, I was almost going, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I bluffed him. I bluffed him, you know. And this man, he was the secretary of the Muslims. He held that position. He walked up to me, and I had met the man before, and his whole back of his hand was totally crushed. And when he shook hands, it was real limp. He could not even make a fist. And he walked up to me, and of course all his Muslim brothers were watching. And he just held it up in front of my face, and he put one hand on his hip, and he said, heal it then. Woo! I thought, I'm either going to see God or not. Of course, all them people behind me, they're just praying like crazy, because they <laughs> knew we were in big trouble here. So, I prayed, and boy, I thought for sure God was going to heal him. I got done and nothing. I thought, oh, Lord, how do I get out of this one? And the next thing I heard myself saying, said, don't worry about it. God said he'd heal it and it's going to happen. You just go back to your seat and see if it doesn't. I'm going, by word, you know, I see these people a couple times a week. It was that next Tuesday I went to a lifers meeting. And as I come into the room, there was a big commotion where the inmates were coming in. And I thought, oh, my and somebody walked in, and you know how Job's comforters are. And they said, he's looking for you. And I thought, oh, no, no, no. You know, and here I am, you know, I'm just. And boy, he did. And he was fighting to get in what the commotion was. And I thought, oh, Lord. 
He comes in and he says, let me shake your hand. And he grabbed my hand and he held that and he liked to put me to my knees. He said, can you imagine this? And he had a great big knot. I mean, all of a sudden a big huge knot. And he said, I went to the doctor and the doctor said, all that dead calcium has all of a sudden came into this one big knot here. He said, everything came right out of my hand into this one big lump. He said, now I'll have to have that the rest of my life. But he said, that's all right. He's doing these things like a spider doing push-ups on a mirror, you know, and all that. He was really proud. I said, now look, his name was Maurice. I said, Maurice, if God really healed it, then that there is going to go away again. I said, it'll be perfect when God's done with it. I thought, what did I just say? You know, here's the big... And so I messed up again, I thought. Sure enough, a week later, he come in. His hand was perfect. And I knew him several years later. Now... Well, it's fine. I thought, well, now, God, it sure wasn't my faith because I questioned everything down the line. And it wasn't his faith because he didn't believe it to begin with. But you see, we don't have all the answers to healing. Like baptism, you've got to stay away from it. You've got to stay away from it. Needless to say, I had a lot of Muslim followers after that. Then he says, to stay away from the resurrection of the dead. How many of you thought God was coming back this September? Don't raise your hands. All right. I mean, last September really got us stirred up, didn't it? We all bought books. No, and this was the day to go. Oh. But God says, no, no, don't get it. And what about tribulation? It's before. No, it's mid. No, it's after. But when is it? Now, all these godly people can't be wrong. But yet, you see, there's not answers to some of this. We may draw our own conclusion and settle our point of view, but you stay away from it. And then he talks about eternal judgment. And there's a lot of discussion on what judgment's going to be and when it's going to be. Who does it and all these things. But see, God says in there, he says, let's go on to perfection. Those things are going to happen if they're going to happen. Isn't that what he says? Read the scripture there. But yet we'll have a tendency to get into discussions with people that don't see it like we see it. I think you can present it. Let it be. It's like this course. I'm presenting it. If you think it's all unscriptural, throw it out. It don't mean nothing to me. If it's going to be, it's going to be. The only thing we're concerned about is salvation. Leading them to the Lord Jesus Christ. After that, the Holy Spirit's in charge of them anyway. But yet we get hung up, and this causes a lot of conflict. So anytime you're working with people who are counseling, stay away from these particular subjects, because you're going to get caught into a trap, and it offends people. They're very opinionated. Fine, I just don't see it that way. No big thing. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I don't have all the answers. Maybe some of you do. I don't know. But I don't, and I leave them alone. I've got my opinions. You want my opinions? I share my opinions. People don't ask me, I don't share. It's that simple. Salvation, absolutely. There's only one thing that's going to save you. And that's having that relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if another person says, I believe that too, then you go on and you work with their peace and their joy. That is the works of the flesh. Now, let's take a look and see what the pride of life is. And I'll read these to save time. Pride. Look on page 8. We'll read these and see where we got these here terms at on page 8 that we're looking at. In Job 32.1, it says, So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. So one of the things with pride is self-righteousness. I think we had all probably come up with that if we had to describe what pride was. Self-righteousness, better than you are, you know, I'm more superior, righteous in our own eyes. Then in 1 Timothy 3, 6, it says, Not a novice, least being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, a novice is a person that wants position. Have you ever... Been in a situation and you say, well, we need someone to head this project. And someone goes, ooh, ooh, I will, I will, ooh, can I be in charge? You better not put them in charge. 
You just found a novice because he'll be lifted up because he wants the position. It's going back to putting people in the position. You never put a novice. You make them prove themselves before they get involved. Position. Leviticus 26, 19. And I will break the pride of your power. And I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. Power. Now, any person that wants a position has pride. I know people that want to be on the board to straighten the pastor out. Pride. Yeah, anybody that is seeking a position is wrong. I mean, when you tell certain people they can't be on the board, they get fighting mad and go to another church. Well, you might as well mark it down. There's a person that's got pride in it. Power. It's interesting. Our last presidential election, there was a candidate, and he happened to have a reverend tacked to his name also. Do you know what his statement was? I don't care if I get to be president. I want the power to control it. Whoa. Man, stuff full of pride. Of course, he had a lot of other things that you could recognize. When a man wants the power to control it, you're dealing with a man that has pride in his life. Ezekiel 28, 5. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thy heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Number four, riches. Money. Just listen to people. Doesn't mean you have to have a lot of it. There's a lot of poor people that have pride about money. Riches. What do they talk about? I have enough money, I can do it. God probably didn't call you to do it then. If you're relying on the money to do it, I tell people, when you make a decision, if you make a decision whether you should do something or not, and you have to consider the money involved, then you're out of line already. It's either God told me to do it or not. If he told me to do it, now I'll be concerned about how to get the money. But you see, a lot of times we make decisions on, I can't do that because I don't have the money. And we miss it. Now, if I had the money, I'd do it. Does that mean God wanted you to do it? Then we have to delete, I believe, the riches off of this. I believe we live in a very affluent society. But maybe we have too much in riches. We talk about faith. But we have to have the money to do it. Is that faith? If you can see it, it's not faith. Riches. Just study on riches. It's, it's amazing what God says about riches. You know, the more money you make, the less sleep you'll get. Don't look at me like that. That's what the Bible says. Study some of these things out. You find amazing little things in the scriptures that no wonder God said the things it is. And you think about it. Get two million dollars. Somebody give you two million dollars and you'll have your phone will be tied up. You'll have to change your number seven, eight times before it's all over. Because people will be coming, calling at you, trying to sell you this, trying to sell you that. You're going to lay awake at nights trying to think how to keep my money. Then he says in Ezekiel 28, verse 11 and verse 17. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Beauty. Beauty comes from pride. You have to take an hour before you can face the world. You have to spend that in front of a mirror. I think I would be considering, do I have the pride here? Beauty. Happen to know a lady. It's absolute. You could hog tire and try to drag, drag her out of the house. But until she spends that 45 minutes in front of the mirror, you ain't going to see her. Beauty. Found an interesting little side note on beauty. You know what we can tell about a man that has long hair? He has pride. Why would a man have long hair? So I can be pretty. You want scripture and verse to back that up? I'll give it to you. Mm-hmm. You see a man with long hair? There's a man that's got pride in his life. 1 Corinthians 11, 13. Judge in yourself. It is commonly that a woman pray unto God uncovered. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. He's talking about if a man is contentious, right? Who? The one that has long hair, right? Now, so we know a person that has long hair is contentious. Now, if you go to Proverbs 13.10, it says, Only by pride cometh contention. So if you have long hair, you're contentious, which that makes sense. A little bit in rebellion there. 
And in Proverbs, it says in 13.10 that only by pride comes the contention, then we know he has pride. Why? Because he has the beauty. You know, it all fits the pattern when you begin to see the complete circle here. But I just thought that was interesting to to say that. And uh, be very careful how you use some of this information. Because a man has long hair, don't walk up and say, I know your problem, you got pride, brother. If he has pride, we know he's in the category of what? Oh, the fool. Now we know all kinds of things about him. You see how this thing begins to work sometimes? God has told us a lot, I believe. Second Chronicles 26, 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Strength to war. Now that makes sense when you get a fool. That they seem to be very strong, don't they? I mean, they'll fight you tooth and toenail. They have the strength to war. A person that becomes and will stand up and flat out reject what you have and war against you is somebody that has pride. Then in Psalms 24, 4, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Psalms 36, 2, For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful, vaunting of oneself. Isaiah 3, 16, Moreover the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, Walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. Vanities of life are deceiving with their own eyes. And we're going to find that a fool is deceived. And we can deceive ourselves. The scriptures refers in many different sections about deceiving ourselves. But all types of vanity, all vanity comes from pride. Can you see the three different categories? Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Now remember... And let me just throw this out right where we're at here. Because a man, let's say, is an alcoholic, he's operating in the lust of the flesh, right? Now, does that make him a scorner, a simple, or a fool? We don't know, do we? Because it's not the manifestation that we're looking at. It is the characteristics, what you want to recognize. Now, once you establish the characteristic, in other words, if he has scorner characteristics then we know that he will, it's the work of the flesh. For instance, a simple person, this person may be very simple and be an alcoholic, but he became an alcoholic because he followed everybody else. Everybody else was doing it, so he did it. And pretty soon he become addicted. But he's one we're going to find out can lay it right down and quit overnight, where the scorner can't. See, and I think in our programs, for instance, in alcoholism, that these programs for drug and alcohol... That they're saying, oh, we have anywhere from a 10 to a 20% cure rate. Well, if you check their statistics, they're probably usually lower. But let's say they have a 10% cure rate, 10 to 12% cure rate. I believe that our secular programs are claiming success on the simple person, not the scorner and the fool. And I'll tell you why. It's the simple person. You go in there and you sit and you watch classes on how if you get drunk and drive an automobile and then they'll show you 15 dead bodies and different things like that. Well, the simple person is easily led. And he's going, oh my, I don't want to wind up like that. Oh no. And out of fear, he'll quit. And so it works for those people. But now what about the other 90% that are walking out and as soon as they get out the next day, they're in drugs and alcohol. You're dealing again with the scorner and the fool. And we're going to find out why and the root problem why that is. Not a scorner. He's going to challenge me. And a fool is going to say, you're crazy and I ain't going to do it. So these two, the scorner and the fool, will not. And so that's why I think is because they bypass the manifestations over here and they deal with the fear, the anger, and the hardened heart. See, and when I deal with that, guess what? The lusty eye, lusty flesh, and the pride of life will clear up automatically. If a person is not angry anymore, then he won't act like a scorner and he'll quit doing the works of the flesh. And of course, a lot of your programs do what? Behavioral modification. If I can get you to do something for 30 days, then you're going to do it the rest of your life. But that's not true. You have to change the heart. You change the heart and the rest of it take care of itself. And that's what I'm saying. When you begin to look at these sins, not one is any greater than the other. No matter whether you're a homosexual or you can't get along with your spouse. 
We need to cure the anger and it's going to take care of itself. People get saved. You don't have to tell them to clean up. You don't have to tell them to cut their hair. You don't have to tell them a whole lot of things. The Holy Spirit will do that. But now if we're not careful, we try to work backwards, don't we? And now you're going to have to clean up and you're going to have to quit doing this. And you're going to... I tell people, you don't have to quit doing nothing. I'm going to get you to the point you just don't want to do it. And there's a difference. And that gives them hope too. So we always want to make sure we know the characteristics before we make any judgments. But once we have the characteristics, we do know which of the three categories they will operate in. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, or pride of life. So, now since we are able to recognize some of these, let me read some scripture to show you some interrelationship of words now that we're going to. Now we're going to begin to move a little faster because now I know how to recognize them. Now I know what sin is. I've got a base to work off of. But let me read some scriptures to back up some of the things that we have stated. In 2 Peter 2.14, concerning the lust of the eye, it says, Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Well, we've read that scripture, that's the lust of the eye. Beguiling unstable souls. Now, look at your master chart. Now, look at the words that, laterally, as we look at our chart here, that he says, the lust of the eye, and then he ties it with the soul. And hearts they have exercised with covetous practice. What's covetous? Is that part of the what? Simple person. We've learned that a simple person will what? Covet. So we've got covet, lust of the eye, and the soul is tied in that scripture. You see the interrelationship? Look at what he says in Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me thy heart. Let thy eyes observe my what? Ways. You can see it on your chart. Look at, over in God's response. So there apparently is a connection here. Proverbs 3, 7. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Who cannot depart from evil? The simple person. So what's he saying? He says in there, thy eyes learn to depart from evil. So he ties departing from evil having to do with what? Through your eyes. And we'll see a little later. Lust of the flesh, Romans 6, 12. Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Lust of the flesh, your bodies. Apparently there's an association with that. Galatians 5, 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. The body with the lust of it. You have to do it, which implies that it has to do with our will. So you begin, you see the words come across on the chart. Second Corinthians 7, 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. In other words, you have to do it. It's an act of your will, okay, in the problem area. Act of your will from all filthiness and the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It's an act of the will for us to come to these things. The pride of life, James 4, 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. He resisteth the proud. And you'll see on your chart, grace and humility. Apparently they are interrelated in this. Daniel 5.20 But when his heart was lifted up, pride, and his mind hardened, hardened heart in pride, he was deposed of his kindly throne and they took the glory from him. Proverbs 14, 3, And the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. What's the opposite of the fool? The wise. Now, it's interesting that in the translation, in the mouth of the foolish, now if you'll look up that definition, that actually means a perverse person or a fool. And then they have in parentheses, it could be foolish, but we distinguish the difference between foolish and the fool. So the scripture is not wrong. 1 Timothy 6, 4 through 14. He is proud. Okay, we're going to talk on this line now. He states out, he is proud, knowing nothing but doubting the questions about questions and strife of words. Now, what does a fool do? He thinks up all these things to stir you up. It's following suit here, what we've studied. Strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds. Who did we find out who was corrupt? The fool, so it's following. And destitute of the truth, we know that. Supposing that gain is godliness, riches. You see how that all begins to tie together when you see that? 
from such withdraw thyself. So you begin to see in your chart how these words begin to interact with each other. We're going to see more and more of this. It's interesting that the elder and the deacon, the one thing that he mentions to the elders and the deacons, He warns them about one thing. Do you know what that is? Pride. Why? Because of the position. Notice what he says in 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elders. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand that he may exalt you in due time. He's talking about pride that you must what? Humble yourself to get grace. He ties those things together. The bishop, he talks about not a novice being lifted up with pride. He fall into condemnation of the devil. That's in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13. Again, we find that it's very easy when we get into position and things are gone right to be lifted up. Pride can slip in very, very easy. In conclusion, in Romans 16, 17, and 19, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are as such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Well, that's what we've tried to do, is present the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life is evil. We know that. Good for you. You're taking the time. Now, as we leave the weakness, I want to touch the problem area. And we're going to begin to associate this back to the simple, the scorner, and the fool. Now, why I wanted you to fill in this whole chart is you're going to see that once I can recognize a simple person, I immediately going to know that their problem area is in knowledge. When I recognize the scorner, I immediately know he has a problem with his wisdom or will. And I know when I see the fool that he has a problem in understanding. And we're going to take a look and I'm going to show you where a man can have godly knowledge and godly wisdom and wind up a fool. And I will give you scripture and verse when we get there. So let's turn to page 17, I believe, in your books. And it says problem area definitions. Is that right? I wanted to go over briefly what these definitions are and then we'll go into the scriptures. Knowledge. To know used in a great variety of senses. Be aware, cause to discern, discover, or have respect. Now, that word senses means our five senses. Our knowledge comes by what we perceive in our five senses. What we see, what we hear, taste, smell, or touch. That's how we get knowledge. I made a note there. Recognition of good and evil, according to the scriptures. I want to be able to recognize what's good and evil with my five senses. That's what we're trying to do when we broke down what sin was. The lust of the eye, lust of flesh, pride of life. Now I have the ability to know that sin. Stay away from it. I can depart from it. Wisdom. Wisdom in a good sense. Skillful wisdom, wisely wit. Comes from a primary root to be wise, intelligent, skillful, or artful. I had a note there that said, ability to perform righteously. See, I cannot perform righteously until I know what to do. So, in reality, knowledge has to come before wisdom. I know that I've sit and listen to people and say, if you don't know what to do, ask God for wisdom. And people do, and God answers, I think, in our ignorance. But really, if God wanted to be a stickler, he would never answer us. Because what we, if we don't know what to do, we need to pray for knowledge. God, show me what I must do. Now, God has shown you what to do. The next thing is... If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Okay, God, I know what I need to do. Now, when do I do it? Let me be skillful and artful in the knowledge that you've given me. Hey, God, you've told me to go build a church. When do I build it? That's wisdom. God will tell you. Now, there's scriptures to back up. If you ask God for a piece of bread, will he give you a stone? No. And it goes on and on and on. But wisdom is when I know that I need to do something, when do I do it to be most effective? Where, what time, how, all the other things to be the most effective for God. See, and that's becoming more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Now, we go back to the principle of the kingdom of God. If you don't have peace about doing it, you know it needs to be done, but you don't have peace, don't do it. God's still talking to you in a small, still voice. 
See, godly wisdom is going to come when you have peace. And if you do it and don't have peace, you never had godly wisdom. It eliminates a lot of frustrations and anxiety out of our lives. The ability to perform righteously. Then we have understanding, intelligence, discretion, reason, skillfulness. To separate mentally or to distinguish. I had a note to the ability to depart or separate from evil. Knowing how things happen, what causes a result, cause and effect. And I think here's understanding. And I kind of like use the example. Let's suppose that there was a lamp here standing up here. When I walked in the room, I had knowledge. I could perceive with my five senses there was a lamp there. Right? So that's knowledge. Now, wisdom is when do I turn it on to be most effective? If I get up in the morning and turn it on and let it burn all day, is that really wisdom? No. Wisdom would be when it got dark to turn it on. Doing the right thing at the right time to be most effective with what I've got. Now, understanding is I go over and I turn this thing on and nothing happens. Oh, I know. Must be a burnt out light bulb. Check the light bulb. Oh, that isn't it. Oh, I understand. I need to plug it in somewhere. Cause and effect. That's understanding. Now, here's the situation. I come in and turn it on. I have knowledge it's there and I know I need to turn it on, which is wisdom. And it don't work. And I don't know nothing about lights. I get very frustrated, don't I? But if I understood it may be a light bulb, it may need to be plugged in, there may be a circuit breaker, guess what? Man, I hold my ground. I'm stable, ain't I? No big thing. We'll just get this thing working. See, understanding establishes us. The Bible even says, and we'll read it, with wisdom get understanding. So let's read some scriptures. Proverbs 2, 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Those three things apparently do exist in the scripture. Now, let's look at... The word knowledge. In Jeremiah 51, 17 and 18. It said, every man is brutish by his knowledge. Who is brutish? Simple person. So see, it gives us a key. Okay, is brutish by his what? Knowledge. Every founder is conformed by the graven image. If we talk about the lust of the eye as image, idol worship. Ah, you begin to see the inner relationship. And his molten image is falsehood and there is no breath in them. They are vanity works of air. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. Did you begin to see the relationship? See, some of these, as we understand these terminology, and we begin to see some inner relationship, you're going to begin to read the Bible entirely different. There's going to be certain passages he was talking about one particular type of individual. Other passages he was talking about another one. Sometimes he talks about two, sometimes three. Proverbs 22, 3, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. And the simple pass on. Well, we've read that before. And apparently the simple person does not foresee evil. In other words, if I can't perceive it, I must have a problem in my knowledge. I can't perceive evil with my five senses. Second Peter 2, 7 through 9. And delivered just lot, vexed with filthy conversation of the wicked. Now notice, begin to have a bearing on him by what? The conversation of people. Filthy conversation or communication began to wear and tear on a just man. For the righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Okay, seeing and hearing is knowledge. Vexed what? His soul. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. That's interesting. He used the word temptation there. To reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. But again, it's by what he saw, by his knowledge. Hanging around people that had filthy communications began to what? Wear and tear on his mind. And God said, I know how to get this here guy out of temptation. Because what? He was in this realm. Apparently he didn't have the knowledge to know don't hang around him type of people because they're going to affect your mind. So God said, I've made a way for temptation. There's always a way to get out of temptation. And you know one of the ways is? Is when I learn through prayer and the word how to recognize evil. I just separate myself from it. But if I don't, guess what? It begins to vex my what? Mind. It begins to wear and tear in my mind. And pretty soon, guess what? It'll wear you down. See, some of the problem, I think, with us... As the body of Christ, we've been hanging around people we shouldn't have hung around with. And of course, as soon as we don't hang around them, the devil says, uh-huh, call yourself a Christian. That's not real love. 
So what's he do? He slips down here and we get angry at ourselves so we go back in here and hang around them. And we learn their ways and become scorners. They argue, we argue. We get in discussions we shouldn't have. But you see, we begin to understand the difference between good and evil. That's knowledge. Let's look at wisdom then. In Colossians 2.23, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not into inner honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Now he says, will worship. You choose to worship that yourself and you choose to neglect the body and you won't allow the flesh to be satisfied. It's a choice. All through the scripture, the works of the flesh is a choice we have to make. You can pray and pray and pray for God to deliver you, and it just don't work. You have to choose to walk away. Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. He says, I try to will myself to the flesh, but it don't work. That's why we've got the Holy Spirit. We're going to learn some things about this. But he ties the flesh and the will together again. Proverbs 14, 6. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. How much straighter can you get? The scorner seeketh the wisdom and he just can't find it. He tries to do right, but he can't. Why? He's got anger. That's why he can't will himself to do those things he knows. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to quit doing drugs. I'll never do them again. God, you know that's true. Praise the Lord. Victory finally. An hour later, we find them all hopped up again on drugs. What happened? It wasn't real repentance. Weren't they sincere? Had us convinced they were. Did God really not touch them? What is going on? What's going on is what it says here. They seek wisdom. They seek to do righteously, but they can't. Why? Because they're still angry. And we're going to find, don't try to get them to repent. Teach them how to forgive. Because once they forgive, repentance will take hold. Then as they will themselves to do righteously, it will happen. 2 Corinthians 8, 11, and 12. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is acceptable according to that a man hath, and not according to the man that hath not. The performing of it, you've got to will yourself to do it. Philippians 2, 13 and 14. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Colossians 3, 5 through 14. Mortify therefore your members. In other words, subdue your members. You do it. Which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness. And he goes through some of the works of the flesh. You have put off the old man with his deeds. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy, beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. What's he talking about? Fruit of the Spirit. He said, you do it. How many times have we went to God and said, God, would you do this for me? We never get an answer, do we? You know why? Because God says, you do it. As you step forward, as you begin to will to do it, then we open a door for the Holy Spirit. Then he talks about forbearing one another, forgiving one another. Oh, there's that word forgiveness in line of them works of the flesh. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all things, put on charity or love. Look at the end of your chart on this here line of the scorner. And you find the word what? Love. See, he ties these terms together. They float across that board. Ephesians 4, 21 through 32, again, he talks about that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man. You put on the new man. Quit lying. Quit the corrupt communication that you need to edify. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. He talks, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. He has that word in there with the works of the flesh again. That always seems to surface out of there. He keeps talking about forgiving. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Second Thessalonians 3, 4. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. Romans 8, 12, 13. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. 
Now, isn't that exciting? You don't have to struggle with the flesh. Well, isn't that what he says here? I know we got some people say, well, you'll have to struggle with it to the day you die. I don't believe that. The devil's got us so convinced that we want to do right, but you can't on this side. It's pathetic. You just can't help yourself. Yes, you can help yourself. Every one of those 25 things you can quit doing tomorrow if you want to. Now, the problem is we really don't want to. It's our will. It's like people say, oh, I'd like to come to Sunday school, but I just can't get up that early. Liar. Yeah. Oh, I worked all night and I'm so tired. I'll come Sunday night. I just can't get out of bed. Liar. If their bed caught on fire, would they get out? Sure they would. Now, what's the difference? Motivation. See, I'm totally convinced you make your soul body do anything it wants to. Now, you can't go out here and live, you know, 500,000 pounds. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you can make this body get up and walk when it don't want to walk. You can make it get up and get dressed and be at church a half hour to spend time in prayer if you want to. The problem is we don't want to because we got every excuse in the world why we can't be here on time. You see, our commitment, our will, just like people that fast and pray. Well, I, I just can't go past one meal. Liar. Just get up and tell your body it ain't going to eat, and that's tough. It's amazing when you talk to your body. I do that when I go on a fast. I get up and say, now, body, you might as well figure it. You're not going to eat for such and such time, and you might as well get used to it. It'll grab, and I'll say, go ahead. Make no difference. You ain't getting nothing, bud. And it's easier. But you see, there's one thing. The more you can control the flesh by your will, the more the Spirit of God will come out, I believe. The Bible says that the flesh worth against the Spirit. And God says for us to will ourselves to control the flesh. So as long as that flesh is doing what it's wanting, that spirit is down there. But when you start crucifying the flesh, the spirit has to start coming out. And the more you can crucify the flesh, the more that spirit comes out, the more sensitive you become. I'm not sure fasting and prayer is an option. God never gives us the guidelines, but you know what? I think he just kind of left it up to us. How much do you really want to serve me? James 3, 13 and 16. We're talking about wisdom here. He said, who is wise among? Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, glory not. Lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. That's interesting. He said that the wisdom that isn't from God is either what? Sensual. Now, sensual is in our senses, the simple person. Sensual. Earthly. Who is earthly minded? Scorner. And who has the spiritual problem? Which is devilish. Now, he come at us in a different way, use different words, but you can see that I can have wisdom through what I perceive. I can have wisdom through my earthly things. And I can have wisdom through a devilish reason. But he says, that is not godly wisdom. Now, let's look at what is godly wisdom. And then we'll evaluate how many people we see in godly wisdom. Verses 17 and 18. It says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, and easily entreated, full of mercy, of good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Now, when you act in godly wisdom, check the next time and see if you have these things in verse 17. Is it pure? Is it peaceable? Is it gentle? Man, we've got everything but that in the body of Christ. No wonder this thing don't work like it should. We get out of step with God. I know I've got to do something. Then God tells me when to do it. Get out your Bible and study verse 17 before you go do it. You want to be effective for God? This begins to happen. And so we see wisdom. And then understanding. Let's read a few scriptures on understanding. Proverbs seventeen twenty seven: He that hath knowledge spareth his words. And a man of understanding is if an excellent what? Spirit. Now he ties understanding on the spiritual realm. If you have understanding, then you have an excellent spirit. Ephesians 4, 18 and 19. Having the understanding darkened... Okay, understanding darkened, which means they apparently are deceived, being alienated from the life of God. Now, are you looking at your chart? So you see understanding and life of God that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. We know it's a heart problem. 
who being in past feelings have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. Who's greedy? The fool. So we begin to see those terms begin to interrelate across the board. Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. We hear a lot of preaching on wisdom, but do we hear it on understanding? Because that's what's going to establish you. It's one thing to do something right. It's another thing to understand why I did it. Because it's like God can tell me, Jerry, you need to do this. And I pray and say, God, when you want me to do it? He says, well, you go do it at such and such a time. I go and do it. And oh, I have a shouting spell. Things happen. But if I don't understand all that is involved, guess what? It comes around again and I become wavy. Back and forth. My house is built sometimes on the sand. Now, God will lead us to these things. But the thing is, I'm one of these. I had a man one time say, you, you don't question God. Well, maybe he doesn't. I do. I'm all the time saying, God, why? Why? Because I want to understand. I want to understand the ways of God to be established. That when the wind blows, I don't care what other people do. I can stand. But without understanding, you're going to topple. Proverbs 8.14 Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. Now we're going to find out that a prudent person has counsel. And then we see where wisdom. So you must have to have knowledge and wisdom to have understanding. Isaiah 47.10 For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness, thou hast said, None seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thy heart, I am and none else beside me. Now what's he saying? He said, Because you had knowledge and wisdom, it perverted you. And you said, I am. And there's none other. I'm totally convinced you can have godly knowledge and godly wisdom and wind up, I am, and there's none other. Let me give you an example of what I've seen sometimes. And I'm just throwing out examples. You all can relate to examples. But I've seen God call ministers, and I'm not picking on ministers, but we're talking to the body of Christ here. He said, I've seen ministers that God said, I want you to build a church that seats 3,000. Amen. When do I do it, God? God says, I want you to start at such and such a time, and I will supply everything. So they start at such a time, and they build this thing. 3,000 seats. God had said, if you'll do that for me, I will fill it. They get it built, and within six months, it's packed out. And he's strutting up and down his pulpit saying, don't tell me how to build churches. I know how to build churches. Woo! There was a man that had godly knowledge and godly wisdom. And he slipped into the full category. We have to be careful. We have to understand. That's one thing he warns about the bishops and anyone in leadership, the elders. Be careful you don't get exalted because of what God does through you. Because God speaks to you don't make you any better. Because God uses you to build a ministry don't mean nothing. It's to understand that it's all done by God and for the glorification of Jesus Christ. And we are nothing. God just chose to use us. And we must remain humble. But how easy it is. And I think most of us can relate. And when God has used us in ministering to people, we're not careful. We get really puffed up. Praise God if you really want to see the Spirit of God come to my church. Whoa, what are we saying here? I am? Our ministry is the one on fire. Whoa, we have to be careful. Because we will slip, even though we are godly people, we can slip down into I am. And we become the fool. It's a deadly thing. And yet, if we use it in the context of... And realize that it's only through the grace of God. I'm here to touch the people. And I'm just a passing through. So things don't count except how I live. It's not what I build and how God uses me. It's what's inside of me. See, I'm totally convinced that I can take an alcoholic that's dead drunk, put him on a, the right pulpit at the right time, and he can preach the word and people will get saved. Does that mean he's holy? And we want to judge so many times by what we see. And how the manifestations are. And what people are doing. I'm afraid that's not the fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. How we know a person is really born again. As a Christian. Is by love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, good faith, meekness, and temperance. That's what we need to develop. Are you beginning to understand how knowledge, wisdom, and understanding begins to relate itself back to the simple, the scorner, and the fool? 
These words are beginning to interrelate in the scriptures. We know that the problem area that the simple person has a lack of knowledge. We know that the foreigner cannot will himself to do what he really knows to do. And we know that fool is deceived in his understanding. Okay? So it's important for kind of stability. And why we go through this is we're going to connect it into root problems in a few minutes. Let me read a couple of scriptures in conclusion. Conclusions, Proverbs 24, 3 and 4. And it reads, Through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Take that verse out and dissect it, break it down. Powerful little scripture. But again, it begins to show us, I think, the very importance of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. It has... It has direct relationships into how our house is built. It's established in what's inside the house.